Today is Wednesday, May 10th, 2023, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 48 tonight, so just a couple more chapters after tonight's class, we will wrap up the book of Genesis, so we are getting near the end. So I want to invite you to take a Bible and be turning with me to Genesis chapter 48. We'll be there in just a few moments. We also want to invite you to be with us this coming Lord's Day at 9.30 in the morning for our Bible study. We are continuing on with our study of the book of Isaiah. And then be with us at 10.30 as well. We would love to see you then. And as always, if you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, we want to invite you to send a text or give a call to the church number, which is 608-224-0274, or you can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. We would love to hear from you in that way, and if you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we also want to invite you to do that as well. Uh, tonight, we are in our family, at least on our way to Tennessee, for our daughter's graduation from Freed Hardeman University, so we are looking forward to that. I hope you'll pray for us to have safe travels. And we hope to be back, Lord willing, next Sunday evening. But I'm not planning on being with you this coming Lord's Day. We plan on worshiping in Springfield, Illinois, if at all possible, on the way back home. But I do hope that to uh, be back with you this uh, next Wednesday, so one week from tonight. But for tonight, we are back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings. It is written by the prophet Moses. And we're now looking at this extended section on the life of Joseph, basically the last one-third of the book of Genesis is dedicated to the life of Joseph and the good work that he did. Uh, despite having been sold into slavery, he is now ruling in Egypt. He has saved a nation from a terrible famine. He's now saved his family as well by bringing them down to settle there in Egypt in the very best of the land. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 48 tonight. And this chapter is somewhat shorter than the others, so we may get done a little bit early tonight. But let's go over to Genesis chapter 48. The first paragraph is verses 1 through 4. Genesis chapter 48, verses 1 through 4. Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. When it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up in the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. We have Joseph pretty much ruling the nation of Egypt at this point, and when he gets word that his father is sick, he knows that it's serious. He's been in bad health for a number of decades now, and so he goes, he takes his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. And when they tell Jacob that Joseph has arrived, Jacob gets it together just enough to sit up in bed. And what an interesting little detail. That's one of those kind of human interest things. I, the Bible didn't have to tell us that, but it's kind of an interesting little detail. But he sits up in bed. And this elderly man now talks about how good God has been to him in his life. And I know I'm not 147 years old like he was at that time, but I know that the longer I live, the more I'm impressed concerning how God has been good to our family. And I'm hoping that God has been good to your family as well. I know many of you who are listening or watching tonight are able to say that. But I know in our family, God has truly taken care of us, not necessarily through wealth and uh, an accumulation of worldly goods, but God has been good in my life, and God is always good. And that's pretty much how Jacob summarizes his entire life at this point. God has blessed him tremendously, and in his case, God has renewed the promise that he originally made to his father Isaac and to his grandfather Abraham. And the promise he repeats here from earlier in his life is that God would multiply his descendants into many peoples and that God would give him this land. Of course, not the land of Egypt. This was not said to him there. This was said to him back home uh, when he was in the promised land. So let's continue tonight then with Genesis 48 verses 5 through 7, the next paragraph. Genesis 48 verses 5 through 7. Now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. But your offspring that have been born after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. Now as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died to my sorrow in the land of Canaan on the journey, 
when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Well, let's remember this is Jacob, also known as Israel, speaking to his son Joseph. And so he's telling Joseph that Joseph's two sons are actually his, belonging to him, Israel. So Israel is claiming Joseph's sons as his own, at least for the inheritance. So he clarifies uh, they will be his sons just as much as Reuben and Simeon are. And what he seems to be doing here is to be giving Joseph a double portion of the inheritance. Now remember, there is no tribe of Joseph among the uh, tribes of Israel, but instead we have Ephraim and Manasseh. And this is where that happens. This is where that starts. So Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, are lifted up, we might say. They are now promoted to where they are now considered uh, the sons of Israel. So these will now be two of the 12 tribes of Israel. We're not exactly sure why. Uh, at least at this moment right here in this paragraph, we're going to have a clue to that later. But this is where it happens. And my guess is this is Jacob's way of continuing to show favoritism to Joseph. I think we would uh, safely assume that based on what we know previously in this book, even if this is all that we know right here up to this verse. He'd done this all of his life. And we should also note that Jacob clarifies to Joseph that the kids born after these two, they're your problem. <laughs> Not literally a problem, but he's saying they'll get the inheritance in Egypt. They're, they are Egyptians, but I'm, I'm claiming these first two as my own. This offer only applies to Ephraim and Manasseh. Well, in verse 7, Jacob reminisces about his wife Rachel, the wife that he loved more than the other, certainly more than Leah and the other two uh, maids or servants are involved there as well, but he, he's thinking back to his favorite wife. And he remembers she died many years earlier at the birth of Benjamin. Jacob is just kind of thinking back over all of this, his life uh, going before his eyes in a sense perhaps, and he's thinking back to how he buried her out there near Bethlehem. And as I back away from this verse a little bit, I'm kind of wondering why he's talking like this right here. Why, why the reference to Rachel? You know, why think about her at this point? And kind of thinking about it, backing away from this, getting some context and some understanding on this, I'm kind of wondering whether the double blessing to Joseph through his children is perhaps Jacob's way of honoring Rachel. So maybe that's why she comes up at this point. In other words, is this something Rachel might have approved of? Or maybe this is just him honoring her in some way. So I'm not positive about that here, but I think it's rather obvious that Jacob is still mourning the death of Rachel many, many years later, even though he's a very old man at this point. So let's continue on tonight then with Genesis chapter 48, verses 8 through 14. The next paragraph, Genesis 48, verses 8 through 14. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. So he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were so dim from age that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them close to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your children as well. Then Joseph took them from his knees and bowed with his face to the ground. Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right, and brought them close to him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. Well, up in verse 8, we learned that uh, what was said previously was kind of in theory. But now Joseph's sons come in, and they need to be introduced. And this, of course, is because Joseph couldn't see very well. We have that little detail here. His eyes are weak. He can't tell people apart. And I think we kind of think back when we read this to Israel's own father, Isaac. If you remember, he had the same problem, didn't he? If you remember, when it came time for Isaac to bless Jacob and Esau, he couldn't see very well. And that's what allowed Jacob to trick his dad into getting the best blessing by cooking the meal and by putting the goat hair on the back of his hands and on the back of his neck. Well, now Jacob himself is the one who's nearly blind at the end of his life, and so now he needs help identifying these kids so that he can give them the proper blessing. So this has come back on him, in a sense, many decades later. Well, Joseph brings them in close, 
They hug, they kiss. There's a greeting going on here. Jacob still seems absolutely uh, thrilled, really almost in disbelief over the fact that he's looking at Joseph again. And not only is he looking at Joseph, he thought that would never happen, but he's looking at his grandchildren. What an amazing blessing that is. And so Joseph bows down, puts his two kids right there in front of his dad with Ephraim on the right and Manasseh on the left. So if I've understood this correctly, the kids are basically now turned around on their grandpa's lap. And so Grandpa Israel and the two kids are facing Joseph. Again, if I get that whole right hand, left hand, left hand, right hand thing going on correctly here. And so, you know, Grandpa Israel and the two kids are there facing Joseph. But when it was time for the actual blessing, notice that Israel crosses his hands, putting his right hand on Ephraim's head, who was on his left, and putting his left hand on Manasseh's head, who was on his right. And with the way that they were sitting, this would have been blatantly obvious. And I don't know about you, but in my mind, when I had read this earlier in my life, I envisioned the two kids directly in front, with Israel just kind of barely crossing his hands over, maybe at his hands or right there at his wrists. But if I read through this again, if I've understood this correctly, as I understand it now, it wasn't that. He wasn't just crossing his hands in front of his face. But rather, his arms had to be completely crossed. It, it would have been incredibly awkward. It would have been very obvious <laughs> that this is the case. So the old man has completely short-circuited. Okay, it's all set up. All he has to do is give the blessing. But here, as he goes to give the blessing, he completely crosses his arms in different directions in order to give a different blessing to the kids, as would, uh, as would be expected. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. So let's continue then as he starts talking. This is Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16. Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16. He blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all Israel, bless the lads, and may my name live on in them. And the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So again, as he has his arms completely crossed with his hands on the heads of the two children, the wrong children, Israel looks straight ahead. And he doesn't bless the children first, but first he blesses Joseph. And so before he blesses his two grandchildren as his children, he starts by blessing his son. And again, remember, Joseph is his favorite son. And the blessing here starts out very general. Basically, God has been with me. God has been a shepherd to me. God's angel has brought me through some very difficult, very dangerous situations. And then he starts to turn his attention to the lads, to the grandchildren, to Joseph's children. And when he just barely starts talking about the children, it looks to me as if Joseph interrupts. You know, I'm thinking that you're probably not supposed to interrupt a blessing right there at the end of somebody's life. But uh, let's continue on and let's pick up with what happens right here immediately with Genesis 48 verses 17 through 19. Genesis 48, 17 through 19. As Israel is talking, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people, and he also will be great. However, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. What a strange paragraph. And with the way most people respect their fathers, I think even especially at the end of life, that this is almost hard for us to imagine. When Joseph sees that his father's right hand is on Ephraim's head, he's upset by this. He's mad. He's he's really, I don't know, confused. He thinks his father's lost it. He physically takes hold of his father's hand to take it off Ephraim's head and to physically put his father's hand on Manasseh's head instead. And so he corrects his father, so verbally and physically. And remember, this is an interruption. 
Israel is giving this blessing, pretty much on his deathbed, just barely gets himself propped up in bed to do this. And Joseph physically and verbally corrects his own father here near the end of his life. However, also notice Israel insists, I know, my son, I know, I get it. And so this is clearly intentional. This is not a case of Israel losing his mind. But this is a case of Israel making a conscious decision to give the firstborn the greater blessing. Or rather, to give the greater blessing to the secondborn and to give the lesser uh, blessing to the firstborn. So this is the way it's going to be. So the greater blessing will go to the secondborn and the lesser blessing to the firstborn. And so the bulk of the blessing, therefore, will go to Ephraim, who is actually the second to be born. Well, let's conclude tonight then with Genesis chapter 48, verses 20 through 22. Genesis 48, verses 20 through 22. He blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Well, it seems as if Israel's blessing on his grandsons was in the form of a blessing that would be repeated over and over down through the years. In future years, his hope was that people would say, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he wanted it to be like one of us saying today, may God make you as wealthy as, and then insert name of the latest, most popular billionaire here. So may God make you like this rich person that we all know, some well-known billionaire. So kind of like that. So Israel wanted his grandsons to be famous for their success so that that blessing would be given uh, for many generations in the future. Notice in the middle here, we have the reminder that Ephraim came first in that blessing. So the blessings themselves aren't terribly different. It's just that his hand, right hand, was on the uh, wrong child, as was uh, maybe expected, uh, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. So this was intentional. And remember, this blessing is coming uh, from a secondborn son. You remember who's giving this blessing? It's Israel. He was the secondborn who also received the blessing of the firstborn. So it's kind of interesting how that's been repeated here. I don't know if you all caught that. Uh, in verse 21, Israel reminds his son Joseph that he's about to die, but God would be with him, be with Joseph, and that God would bring their people back to the land of their fathers. So Egypt would not be their permanent home. They were just passing through this land. And in the last verse, Israel explains what we had assumed earlier in the chapter, that he has blessed his sons instead of him as a way of giving his family a double blessing. And so he was kind of being special for Joseph here by doing this. Obviously, Joseph doesn't need any wealth. Uh, he's in charge of the land of Egypt. He has everything he can handle, then some. And so he's kind of using that as an excuse to uh, give a blessing, a double blessing to his son through his grandchildren. And this brings us to the end of Genesis 48. And in terms of practical application, I'll try to mention this again in our study next week. Uh, but even in this week's passage, I think we see the value of giving a blessing to our children before we die. Um, and this seems to be something of a lost art, doesn't it? Kind of a lost tradition. I don't see this happen very often in our society, but there is a value to it. And I know we've mentioned this before, and again, I'll mention it next uh, Wednesday, Lord willing, but we might think of uh, creating what is usually referred to as an ethical will. An ethical will. I would encourage you to look that up. Just Google ethical will and uh, read some articles about that. You know, a last will and testament, that's how we pass along our stuff to the next generation, isn't it? So it's got stuff about our house and our bank accounts, and this goes to this person, this goes to this person. Whoever gets the family dining room table, you get the whatever. Well, um, a living will, what is that? That's how we express our wishes concerning how we'd like to be treated uh, physically when we're no longer able to make decisions for ourselves near the end of life. So life support, feeding tubes, uh, drastic measures, CPR, that kind of thing. Well, an ethical will is how we pass along our spiritual wishes and other life lessons to the next generation. Some of you know when I was working on a degree in organizational communication, I did a semester-long observation over at Grace Hospice Care in Fitchburg at that campus. And I think probably some meetings outside that campus as well, if I remember that correctly. Um, but I remember going and observing as many meetings within that organization as I possibly could. 
And as I was doing that, you know, these are meetings between doctors and nurses and the care team and caretakers and all kinds of staff at all levels, including the board of directors over there. But several times uh, they would mention an ethical will. I kind of wondered about that. And maybe you'd heard the term before, maybe not. It wasn't familiar to me. And so I started looking into that. I got some information from them, but it's basically a short document, usually a page or two. And it expresses our hopes and our dreams for our children, specifically spiritual hopes and dreams. That's kind of the, the ethical part of it. And I have one from my great-grandfather who has a list of kind of meditations or life reflections, things that he's learned in life about a page long. Uh, I have one from my own father, and I, uh, I treasure that document about a page long, very similar uh, in its scope and its kind of aim, passing along his wishes for future generations in our family. But it has a way of bringing some closure to our lives. If you can think about that from a hospice point of view, as somebody's in their last few weeks or days, uh, getting that on paper and maybe being coached through that, what do you want to communicate to your children? and to your grandchildren, a huge value in doing that. It has a way of bringing closure to us. Uh, it also is maybe good for those left behind to have something in writing, something that they can remember and pass along to their children and grandchildren. So I'm just saying it's a little bit close to what we have here, just written instead of spoken in person. And again, we'll have more of this in chapter 49, but we'll get into that uh, next week. Uh, but I would just encourage you to consider it. Do some research concerning what's involved in creating an ethical will. And uh, hopefully we'll get back to that next week if the Lord wills. But uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I hope most of you can come to class and worship this coming Lord's Day. Class at 930, back to Isaiah. And then Phil Vermillion will be our guest speaker at 1030 if the Lord wills. So let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you, Father, for giving us this account, this record of Jacob's life, so that we can learn from it. And we pray, Father, that we would live our lives in a way that we can be good examples to our children and our grandchildren and the generations to come. Bless us as we pass along our faith in you to those who will come after us. Our Father, we come to you humbly with great thanksgiving in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen.